In this video, we are going to talk about data splitting, which is a common way to approximate generalization error. How do we do it? We are given this training data. We keep aside some randomly selected portion from the training data. We fit or train our model only on this training portion. And we score or assess our trained model on this set aside data. So what we are trying to do here is we are pretending that this set aside data is representative of the real data. It's representative of our unseen examples. If our model is performing well on the training data, that is if it is giving an error of zero on the training data, that's good, but we don't really feel very confident about our model because it might be possible that it's just modeling some quirks in the data. But if our model also performs well on this set aside data, which it hasn't seen before during training, then we can feel more confident about our model. So it does sound like a reasonable thing to do. How do we do it using scikit-learn? Scikit-learn has this very handy function called train test split. I'm showing you documentation of the function here. So in this function, basically you can pass X and Y, or you can also pass your data frame. If you pass it X and Y, it will give you X train, Y train, and X test, Y test. So training portion of X and Y, and test portion of X and Y. If you provide it a data frame, then it will give you train portion of the data frame and test portion of the data frame. We can also specify the train or test split sizes. For example, if I specify my test size as 0.2, it will split the data into two parts, 80% in the training and 20% in the test split. Let's look at a toy example. Here I have 10 different examples. These blue things are my features and this orange column is my target. These are the indices of my examples. When I call train test split on this data using test size of 0.2, then I will have 80% of the data in my train split and 20% of the data in my test split. So this green portion is my train split and pink portion is my test split. Notice the indices here. When we call train test split, it first shuffles the data and then splits it into train portion and test portion. And here I'm showing you this lock just to convey this idea that once we split the data, we put this test data aside. We put it in this imaginary chest lock. So we do not touch it when we are building our model. Now let's try to use train test split on some data set. Here is our Canada USA cities data set. I'm creating X and Y from this data set. And just to remind you in this data set, we have two features, longitude and latitude. And let's look at why. Our target here is the country. So these are the longitudes and latitudes of cities. And these are the target countries for these cities. Now let's try to call train test split on this X and Y. I'm using test size of 0.2 again. So we are doing 80-20 train test split here. Let's look at the sizes of our X, Y, and our X train, Y train, and X test, Y test. X has 209 rows. So the shape of X is 209 and two, that makes sense. Y only has one column, that's our target. So its shape is 209. Then our training data now should have 80% of our X. So it has one six, its shape is 167 and two, which makes sense. And X test 
just has like 20% of our original data. And it has 42 examples, which makes sense. Now, sometimes we want to keep the target when we do the splitting because we want to do some exploratory data analysis or we want to visualize our data. And for that, train test split also allows passing data frame. In the previous example, we passed X and Y to train test split, but now here I'm passing the data frame. I'm again asking for 80-20 split. And now my output is my train portion of the data frame and test portion of the data frame. So this is my train DF. I'm just printing train portion of my data frame. It has both features and it also has the target. And here I'm showing you an example scenario why I might need this. So I'm plotting my data here. On the x-axis, I have longitude. On the y-axis, I have latitude. And I'm color coding the target. OK, so this is just an example scenario why we might need to do splitting on the data frame instead of doing it on x and y. Now that we have split our data, let's try to train our model on x train and y train. So here is our model. It has built a very, very complicated model because we are not specifying any depth here. If we do not specify any depth, then it is no depth. So it goes all the way till the end. Okay, so it has built this very complicated tree. Now we can look at training accuracy and test accuracy. Now we have kept aside our test data we haven't used it in the training. And now we want to see how our model performs on this test data. And it will tell us its generalization accuracy. OK, so we see that our training accuracy is 1. So it, this complex model, it's predicting everything in our training data perfectly. but when we look at our test accuracy, it's a different story. Our test accuracy is just 0.738. So that means that here we are not able to generalize that well. We build this perfect model on the training data, but our model is not able to generalize well on this test data, on this set aside data. So I'm showing you these two pictures here. In this left picture, I'm showing you our model, the decision boundary of our complex model that we saw before. And the data in this picture is our training data. So it is building this complex decision boundary so that it can perfectly classify each and every example in our training data. But if we plot our test data on the same decision boundary, we see that it has some mistakes here, right? So there are these red triangles in the blue region and blue circles in the red region. So that means that we, are, we have built this perfect model on the training data, but it is not actually a very reliable model. It is probably capturing some quirks in the training data. Now here are some useful arguments for our train test split. We briefly talked about test size. There, can, there is also this train size argument. And as I mentioned before, uh, you can specify what kind of split do you want. And in the previous examples, we use this 80-20 split. But this is not always an easy decision. On the one hand, we want as much data as possible in the training portion. But at the same time, we also want enough data in the test portion. If we have only a few examples in the test portion, then our test accuracy won't be that reliable. So we kind of have to figure out how much data we have and make our decision based on that. And some common splits are 
80-20 split, 90-10 split or 70-30 split. But just remember that this decision is not always easy. Then there is another useful argument called random state argument. As I mentioned before, when we call train test split, the data is shuffled before we do the actual splitting. And this is actually very important and it's a crucial step and you will be exploring this in your lab. So this random state argument, it controls the shuffling of the data. So if you set this argument, then you will get the exact same shuffling every time. So in the previous case, I had set it random state to one, two, three. And so I could reproduce my shuffling. Some of you may have heard of this term validation data. The idea is to create another split in the training portion. This was our previous train test split. This is our training portion and this is our test portion. What we do now is we apply train test split again on this train portion. Here I'm applying 75-25 split on this training portion and I'm creating this new train split and a validation split. I'm not touching my previous test split. Why you might want to do that? Remember that in our previous example, we had training accuracy of one, but our test performance was not that good. So what do we do in that case? The idea here is that we create this another split in the training data. And now we train our models only on this new training split and we score them on this validation split. If the score is not that good, then we train another model, for example, by changing hyperparameters. And then we test that model again on this validation split. We keep doing that till we get reasonable performance, reasonable accuracy on this validation split. Now note that we are not using this validation split to call fit anytime. We are calling fit only on this training split. This validation split is only used to score our model. Now there are many subtle points here and we will get to those points later in the course. But right now you can think of this as we use this validation split for hyperparameter tuning to find the best model. And once we have a model that performs reasonably well on this validation split, we feel more confident about that model. And we hope that it will also perform well on the test split. And finally, it will also perform well when it's deployed. So just to let you know, there isn't a good consensus on, the, the, on this terminology of what is validation set and what is test set. How we will use it in this class? So usually when we say validation, we will refer to data where we have access to the target values, but unlike training data, we only use this for hyperparameter tuning and model assessment. And we never call fit on this data. And when we use the term test data, which was this data in our chest log. Again, we have access to the target values, but unlike training and validation data, we do not use it for training or hyperparameter optimization. Once we have the best model from hyperparameter optimization, we use that model and we use our test data to assess that best model. So when we say test data, we use it only once to evaluate the performance of the best performing model. Now, at the end of the day, what we want is we want to deploy our model. We build our best model and then we deploy it. And our hope is that our model performs well on some unseen data in the wild.
we will refer to that data as deployment data. Now, this is not a well-established term. Uh, Mike came up with this terminology actually, and I liked it, so I have adopted it. We will use the term deployment data to refer to this data where we do not have access to the target values. And at the end of the day, performance on this data is what we care about. And our assumption is that our validation set and test set are proxies of this deployment data. So if we see reasonable performance on uh, validation data and reasonable performance on test data, we hope that our model will perform okay in the wild. Let's summarize what we just discussed. We talked about train, validation, test, and deployment data. We call fit, score, and predict on training data. We do not call fit on the validation data. We use it for hyperparameter optimization, and we call score and predict multiple times on validation data. Once we have the best model after hyperparameter optimization, we use the test data to assess our model. So we call predict and score only once on the test data. For all these three, for training data, validation, and test data, we have access to targets. For deployment data, we do not have access to the targets. And we use our model for predictions on this deployment data. And typically, you, you can expect that your training error is less than your validation error, which is less than your test error, which is less than your deployment error. In the next video, we will talk about cross-validation.